So I interleaved a couple of uh, neuro-related topics, or <clears throat> maybe they're directly neuro in here from our uh, MSK service. Um, first one's on peripheral nerve imaging. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, kind of what you need to know. And uh, so this is an area of imaging that I think is increasing in uh, interest and uh, applicability. It's probably largely because of better imaging with 3T. And so uh, how many people in the audience are doing get referrals for like dedicated nerve, peripheral nerve imaging? A few? Okay, good. Well, hopefully this will be helpful for everyone. We'll go through some of the background. We'll talk about imaging techniques and then mainly focus on looking at some cases and interpretation. <clears throat> so we often in radiology don't really think about the peripheral nervous system that much except when we perhaps look at the spine um, or nerve involvement of, of tumors, but the, uh, there's a lot of nerves out there and uh, more anatomy for us to, to learn. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so, as I said, we're doing better with it these days. If we look at the anatomy of a typical nerve, I took the sciatic nerve here as an example, and what we see on imaging on this T1-weighted scan here is a bundle of low signal foci in, in, inside this ovoid structure, the nerve itself. And so these dark dots are what are called fascicles. <clears throat> and the important thing to realize is that the, the nerve fascicles are not individual axons or individual nerves you know, themselves, but they're, bun they're bundles of neurons, as shown in this cartoon here, where the, the actual axons are really tiny within the fascicles, and then they're enveloped by endoneurium, perineurium, and epineurium um, soft tissues, and they, they may or may not be myelinated nerves, in which case they would have Schwann cells around them. The tricky thing about nerve imaging is that a lot of these nerves are small, right? So even the sciatic nerve is only about seven millimeters in diameter, but many of the peripheral nerves are one to two millimeters in size, and so very, are very difficult to actually uh, localize. MR is typically limited by signal to noise, resolution, and the quality of the fat suppression. And clinically, it's often hard for a, a clinician to localize where the symptoms are coming from. So they might, you know, have a lower extremity uh, symptoms, but not know if it's from the hip all the way down to the ankle. And so we have the challenge of trying to either image in a really long area or really work closely with our clinicians to get uh, better history and target in on the exam. <clears throat> the other thing is that in general, the incidence of nerve abnormalities is low, and even if there's something abnormal, it's uncommon to get biopsy results, so there's not a lot of good feedback that we get. And finally, if they're abnormal, the findings are often subtle, and I guess one other key point I'll make is that in our division of five or six MSK radiologists where we mainly do this interpretation, um, there's a lot of inter-observer variability. Some people are very, very sensitive. Some are, are less sensitive for calling a nerve abnormal. And so that, that affects things as well, the, the inner observer variability and our, our limited experience overall. <clears throat> so why would we want to scan anyway? Well, um, my colleague Amelie Lutz put this slide together, which I think is a good summary of the different possible indications. So typically, it's important to realize that many patients have had the spine worked up, and it's, quote, normal, or at least the findings on the spine don't explain the peripheral nerve symptoms. There may be electrophysiologic measurements that point to a nerve disorder, possibly suspecting a tumor or trauma, um, nerve entrapment type synd syndromes where they're looking for preoperative planning, um, sometimes postoperative cases, and then many of the patients that have peripheral polyneuropathies managed by neurologists don't really get a lot of imaging done if the diagnosis is known, but if there's a change in the symptoms or atypical symptoms, they may get imaging. A number of disorders will cause nerve uh, problems, including diabetes probably being the most common thing, and we're all aware of peripheral neuropathy. Um, typically in that, we see the end organ manifestations of it in things like Charcot foot, uh, muscle denervation change. Don't really often see direct nerve abnormalities in diabetic neuropathy. You have trauma, entrapment syndromes, tumors. Um, there's some hereditary neuropathies. I'll show a couple of examples of those. And then you can have infectious or inflammatory nerve disorders as well. <clears throat> so in terms of the imaging, this term MR neurography is out there. And actually, we, we went ahead and decided to, to allow our uh, referring physicians to order, quote, MR neurography studies. Uh, we can talk maybe at the break about 
um, reimbursement issues, but it can be a little bit problematic. So um, we use the term neurography, and conceptually what this indicates is uh, having some sort of a, a MIP of the nerves that shows it in a three-dimensional representation, like you'd have an angiogram or a myelogram type representation. Um, but the reality is we don't necessarily rely on this type of imaging. It's mainly, mainly just for a display. So really the most important images to obtain are high resolution T1 and fat suppressed T2 images that are short access to the nerves of interest. It's kind of like any uh, tubular or cylindrical structure like a blood vessel or the colon. Um, it, it's useful to image that in cross section so you can see inside and outside at the same time. <clears throat> so we really don't necessarily even create these MIP type images in our practice. We do it ad hoc, but they're really not as useful diagnostically as they are just for making a pretty picture. Other technique things, 3T is better because of the higher signal to noise and resolution. Again, T1 and T2 fat sat imaging. Um, short axis, I mentioned that. Um, there are a number of 3D sequences that can be used, and I'll show examples of what we do, we do um, at Stanford. Um, it's important to get uniform fat suppression because if you're looking for a subtle abnormality within a nerve, it can actually be affected by fat suppression that, that varies across, across the image, and you might artifactually uh, make a mistake about a nerve being hyperintense or hypo-intense if that uh, fat suppression is not uniform. You have to use dedicated, dedicated coils, and you need to limit the coverage of the exam or break it up into several different types of exams. And I think we've convinced our clinicians that, in fact, yes, we need to um, limit the coverage of our exams. And I'll show, I'll show you how we do that in just a moment. Sort of a general neurography protocol, again, really focuses on axial or short axis T1 and high res T2 fat sat images. So I'll talk about the brachial plexus in a little bit, but for, so for the brachial plexus, um, a sagittal would be more perpendicular to the nerves than transverse axial. Um, so we'll do, we'll do those type of images. We always will do some sort of a coronal or sagittal 3D type sequence, although admittedly, these are not always that useful. And then often we'll use STIR to complement things, to, especially in terms of looking for muscle edema. So this is how we originally broke things up and uh, continue to do so at Stanford. So the exams are called like MR neurography upper extremity. And so it's um, for the upper extremity, it's like around the shoulder, around the elbow, or around the wrist. And the idea is that the protocols cover more territory than a shoulder MR exam for like rotator cuff disease. They cover about half of that uh, upper extremity or half of the arm here with some overlap. So if somebody wanted to get uh, MR neurogram of the entire right upper extremity, they'd have to actually order three separate examinations. Now, it's typical we'll end up having two examinations be done, <clears throat> and same type of thing is done for the hip, knee, and ankle and lower extremity. We're sort of evolving towards what uh, I'm thinking of anatomic division centered, where since we ended up doing a lot of double exams here, that, that's pretty expensive and a lot of time for the patient. Uh, the uh, referrers are asking us to do like, well, let's just do the arm, the upper arm, and just call that one exam, and we can typically do that. Okay, it just doesn't focus as much on the joint disorders because the joint's sort of secondary to compared to what we did before. <clears throat> For the central plexus uh, imaging, brachial plexus, um, uh, our neuroradiology colleagues tend to like it centered about the brachial plexus. In MSK, we tend to have it off-center and I'll show examples of lumbosacral plexus imaging in a minute. <clears throat> the lumbosacral plexus is um, something we don't often think about, again, in imaging, but I want to point out that there's the lumbar plexus from T12 through L4, shown on the right side here, and then there's the sacral plexus, shown on the left side here, from L5 through S4. The big nerves that you should be able to identify on pretty much any examination are the femoral nerve, which is shown right in here. It's actually hard to see on this um, cartoon, but right there, and of course the sciatic nerve, the sciatic nerve being a fairly large nerve. Some of these other smaller nerves, like the obturator nerve, genitofemoral nerve, iliohypogastric nerve, they're so small they can be very difficult to actually even identify. <clears throat> and that's a problem. So small nerves may not be even seen. Um, blood vessels, especially veins with bright signal within them from slow flow, can mimic nerves. Uh, uniform fat suppression may make the nerves look bright on one side or the other. Nerves are susceptible to magic angle phenomenon, and so you have to avoid a lot of proton density weighted imaging. 
and there are some variants that occur, like a split sciatic nerve. <clears throat> so let's talk about interpretation. So typically the spine will have been assessed previously, and, uh, and disc disorders, degenerative conditions explain a huge number of peripheral nerve problems. You want to have a good idea what the clinical information is to know what to, what to target. Uh, we then want to go through the exam and identify the major visible nerves, assessing them for the size, their course, is it a smooth course, or is there some angulation happening, the nerve intensity, and if there's any scar tissue around, and then ask yourself, is it just one nerve involved or multiple? Obviously look for mass lesions, and then we look for the sort of sequelae, like is there any muscle edema or atrophy that could be related to a denervation? <clears throat> so here is an example of kind of typical peripheral nerves, the tibial and common peritoneal or fibular nerves about the knee. And again, the tricky thing is we get sort of, you know, focus our attention on a lot of structures where this, the nerves are these little things right back here. So you actually have to dedicate and, you know, look for the nerve. So let me zoom in on these, this area here. And the key thing is that the nerves can be difficult to identify on the fat suppressed images. So if you have, you know, slightly bright nerve with dark fat around it, um, it's not that conspicuous. But on a T1-weighted image or a proton density-weighted image, for that matter, without fat suppression, you have this beautiful fat-nerve contrast. And so you can identify where the nerves are located and then do the same exact slice location for the T2-weighted imaging. This, this case happens to be a PDFS. Um, and then you know you can map that across to the nerve and then look at the signal intensity very carefully. <clears throat> Here's an example of abnormal nerve, but very subtle. So actually. Let's look at this one on the right side. Here's a little tiny nerve here, barely can see it. Um, and the signal intensity here is just this little tiny wisp. I would submit you were barely even gonna ever notice that thing. On the left side, right adjacent to the anterior aspect of the iliac crest, there's a really bright focus here. And that's a lateral femoral cutaneous nerve that's hyper intense because it's irritated. So here's zoomed in, nerve there and nerve there. This is from a colleague uh, at, in, in Texas, Avnish Chabra, and so it's an example of, you know, looking for this neuralgia parasthetica, and actually you really would need to know that clinical information and know where to look even to see this abnormality, otherwise you're likely to just gloss over uh, this entire abnormality. <clears throat> it turns out that this is due to, uh, in some cases, these skinny genes, which tend to ride sort of low across the hips and are just in right location coming across that they can pinch that lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. So knowing that, I've pretty much stopped wearing skinny jeans myself um, and uh, wearing the sort of baggier, you know, <clears throat> dockers and so forth. I want to convince you that you can see abnormalities in nerves. And it took me a while. I was very skeptical about this whole field. But uh, I do believe that you can see abnormalities within nerves. And I, I think I can convince you of that, too. So just take a look at this example. So here's the sciatic nerve. It's kind of in two different bundles. And then on the T2 fat set, you see it's brighter here than in this component right here. And this is a little cine loop here. So as I scroll down, <clears throat> and I can try to point at the same time up here. See that? See how bright that focus is there compared to the other part of the nerve? And so there's definitely peripheral nerve abnormality. It's not always fair to say neuritis because it's not always inflammatory. But, but you can see that some components of that nerve are of normal intensity and some are of hyperintensity right in there. <clears throat> this was a patient who'd had this hip arthroplasty done and probably some mechanical issue happened because it's got protrusio and in the, the sciatic nerve goes immediately behind the acetabulum. So that nerve is likely to be impinged on by the, uh, by the prosthesis somehow. <clears throat> Um, when you look downstream, so this is denervation change. So here's the anterior compartment of the left calf, and here's hyperintensity within the muscles of the calf for that denervation uh, uh, injury to the nerve upstream. Even though it's not a complete nerve transection, it's just these fascicles that go to this part of the, of the uh, calf are abnormal. And specifically, this is involving the uh, fibular nerve, the common perineal nerve. <clears throat> Here's another case just to show you that if you look at the whole nerve here, then you map it across to here. There's several fascicles that are abnormal. About half this nerve is hyperintense. This was a young woman that had a, had a nerve tumor, small benign tumor removed upstream from this, and this is like downstream de degenerative change within the nerve. <clears throat> 
Nerve tumors are fairly common and they're, they're obvious, right? And so you want to, when you identify a lesion that's, you know, looks like it could be along the course of a nerve, you want to look specifically for that nerve. So here's a nice example of a tibial nerve with a, a neurogenic mass along its course. <clears throat> so I have a number of cases here to go through and um, just kind of move along with this. So this is a football player who had shoulder pain and some mild weakness, and we could see that there's a multilobular cystic structure along the uh, glenoid here, Par kind of, a, so it turns out it's a paralabral cyst, although you can't really see the labral tear that well. Um, and it's sitting in this notch here in the scapula. So this is actually um, the spinoglenoid notch in here. I'll show that anatomy in just a, in just a second. You can see the mild hyperintensity that's occurring in the infraspinatus muscle in here. So that's some denervation change because this cyst is pushing on the branch of the suprascapular nerve that goes to the infraspinatus. And so <clears throat> if we look here, oops. As I scroll through, you can see the, the cyst here along that um, <clears throat> spinoglenoid notch and the hyperemia, sorry, hyperintensity in the infraspinatus muscle there. Um, I'm going to talk more about brachioplexus in a minute, but uh, this is a high-grade case where there's nerve root avulsion proximally, and we'll get back to that in the next talk. A shoulder, a different shoulder patient here. So here's a patient who had no trauma, um, but had six months of shoulder pain and weakness, and we can see that there's a lot of hyperintensity in multiple shoulder girdle muscles here. You can see as I scroll through on these sagittals, it's involving supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and actually some of the deltoid. So one of the things you want to ask yourself if you see a pattern like this is, well, what nerves could be involved that are responsible for this pattern? And so there's, there's different ways to think about it. I'll show you in just a second how, uh, how I do that. Um, sorry, a little flaky on the movies here. But, okay, so here's that same patient. These are the oblique coronal images. And the reason I'm showing these is to illustrate that the T1-weighted images look fairly normal. The T2 fat-suppressed images, you can identify that hyperintensity within muscles. If you're just doing proton density with fat sat, the denervation change in the muscles is not quite as conspicuous because the muscles still have a fair amount of signal within them on the PD image compared to the T2. <clears throat> Here's just a summary of this. So there's supraspinatus, there's infraspinatus, deltoid, and does anybody know what disorder can cause this? So it's more of a brachial plexus abnormality, brachial neuritis, so-called Parsonage-Turner syndrome, which is an idiopathic inflammatory disorder of the brachial plexus. So that nerve anatomy about the shoulder is important. So here's a scapula, and so this is from the back, the scapular spine, and the suprascapular nerve comes up and it goes through this suprascapular notch at the top of the scapula, but then that nerve continues and gives off the infraspinatus branch in the infraspinatus fossa here to supply the infraspinatus. So from a front view, the bony structure, here's the suprascapular notch, a small notch with a ligament typically above it, and then in the back is the spinoglenoid notch at the base of the spine. So they're actually fairly close together. If you look from the top of the scapula, here's suprascapular notch, and just down around the corner is the spinoglenoid notch. But depending on which of those is involved with one of these cysts, you'll get different nerve denervation patterns. So a lesion at the suprascapular notch can actually affect both the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. If it's lower down in the spinoglenoid notch, it tends just to get the infraspinatus. And then there's a few other disorders. There's quadrilateral space below the, in the axillary region. You get teri teres minor and deltoid, edema and atrophy. If you have a plexus injury, it could be multiple non-contiguous uh, muscles involved, including that Parsonage-Turner. And even though we see a lot of cervical spine degenerative change, and so we don't typically see um, muscle problems with that, I've seen a couple of cases where there's like radicular distribution, denervation change in muscles from nerve impingements. Another interesting thing about the shoulder is uh, that patients can get atrophic change of the infraspinatus like this um, this person here in the, in the right side, not a different than this old Stanford volleyball player. But this is a case that I had of that where you can see this denervation change in the infraspinatus muscle here. So here's supra, infra, teres minor. This was an MR arthrogram, so that's why they have the fluid in the joint. 
And this is actually due to stretch of the suprascapular nerve in the spinoglenoid notch. And it's probably because of contractile activity of the infraspinatus that puts traction on that infraspinatus branch of the suprascapular nerve and then injures the nerve and you end up with that atrophic change without a real anatomic abnormality. <clears throat> All right, moving down towards the lower extremity, 21-year-old woman, difficulty walking. A clue is that she was a piano player. Um, and so if we look at her <clears throat> sciatic nerve proximally, you can identify where the nerve is located right here. And on the T2-weighted image, it looks normal. So there's a little vessel right next to it with normal signal intensity of the nerve. When we go into the mid-thigh, here's the sciatic nerve right here. And in here is markedly hyperintense, increased size of the fascicles. And this was present all the way down her left thigh. Indeed, it was actually present going all the way down the right thigh as well. So here's some T1 and T2 fat suppressed images. The nerve is still fairly normal in the region of the ischial tuberosity here and here. And there's some narrowing here that might be some ischiofemoral impingement, which I don't know if that's uh, important in this case or not. It's, it's conceivable it could be. But as we go further down in the, in the thigh, you can see how markedly enlarged and hyperintense these fascicles are going all the way throughout the thigh. So we really you know, don't have biopsy proof of this to know exactly what it is, but she was seen by a neurologist and um, thought to have a disorder called um, hereditary neuropathy with liability to pressure palsy. And it's sort of like if you think about your, uh, your funny bone, if you hit that ulnar nerve behind the elbow, it gets irritated for a few seconds or a few minutes. Um, these people have very sensitive nerves and they get they become abnormal for weeks or months if there's pressure put on it. So one of the thinking was, because if she's sitting on this hard piano bench quite a bit, it was actually causing um, the nerves to be uh, enlarged and edematous. Actually, with fairly little in the way of symptoms, she did have some difficulty walking, but not a huge amount of like uh, weakness. Um, another case that I just want to try to convince you that things you can see abnormal nerves. So here's a 74-year-old woman, two years of left thigh pain, and there's a lot of information right on these scans, T1, fat suppressed, T2. Um, and so we get, as radiologists, we're, we find all kinds of things to draw our attention to. But I think what's tricky is to know when you're looking for nerves, you know, you have to really drill down. So what I want to point out here is that the femoral nerve sits in this groove between the psoas muscle and the iliacus. So on the right side, this little dot right there, that's the femoral nerve on the right. And then on the left side, it's over here. Now, if you look at the T2-weighted images, see how that's hyperintense right there compared to there? So that's abnormal. And I think if I show you the, um, I'll show you the coronal movie in just a second, but it's, it's easy to see how you could easily walk by that disorder. So again, on axial images, remember the old nerve artery vein anatomy? So on the right side, this is the femoral nerve here. And so on T2, it's like right in here. But on the left side, here's the femoral nerve here. And on the left side, see it's bright. So that's how subtle things can be, and it's very easy not to make that observation. So in practice, what we do is we obtain um, both coronal T1 and fat suppressed T2 2D images, but then we also obtain a 3D sequence that has uh, images with fat suppression and without, if you will. So this one, I think it's just the T1 and the T2 fat set next to each other. But if you look at the left side here, so here's the femoral nerve here. Here's the right femoral nerve. Just see what happens over here as I scroll up and down. Can you see, can you, do you believe me that that femoral nerve is a little bit hyper intense compared to the one on the left side, on the right side? <clears throat> so this is thought to be uh, a femoral nerve abnormality. Whether it's a true neuritis or not, we don't know, but it could definitely help explain some left-sided hip region pain. So what do you do if you can't actually see the nerve? Well, what I typically say is something like this. While the blank nerve is uh, below the resolution of the scan. We don't see a mass lesion along its expected course, and then you want to look downstream and see if the muscles have normal signal intensity or not. Next case, so here's uh, some different sections from the pelvis all the way down through the thighs in this patient, and there's a lot of atrophy involving gluteal musculature, hamstrings bilaterally, um, deep quadriceps on the left side, sort of symmetric. There's not much in the way of edema in these muscles. They're just really a tremendous amount of atrophy, I guess, going along with the, the 50 years of, of symptoms. 
And so the point about this case is to show that not everything is a nerve problem. This is actually a, a myopathy problem, a muscular dystrophy, fascio-scapulohumeral muscular dystrophy involving muscles, but not necessarily nerves. Um, I like this case a lot. So here's, we're gonna go through, I'll, I'll let you I'll kind of scroll through and <clears throat> let you see if you can see the, the findings here. So there's one finding going by there. And if I go further down, <clears throat> here's kind of the other imaging observation here. So if we come back up towards the, the proximal fibula here, so here's tibia, fibula. This is the common fibular nerve here. Or this is probably the deep branch that's taking off and heading down into the anterior compartment of the calf. And it's affected by this cystic lesion, this ganglion cyst that's sitting right in front of the fibula here. So you can, you can see where the nerve is sitting right, right, yeah, I can't hold right that still, right there, <laughs> sorry. And then it's the nerve there. Um, and so it goes right into that lesion. And so downstream what we see is denervation change in the anterior compartment of the calf. And so there's the sort of summary. It's just this, this uh, anterior compartment, the, the perineal compartment is actually spared here. So that's getting the deep fibular nerve or the deep perineal nerve. And it's interesting because what it seems to happen in, in patients is if they get a ganglion cyst involving the, the proximal tibiofibular joint, it actually can make its way into like the articular branch of that nerve, and then that can kind of dissect its way into other components of the nerve, uh, either, either doing that, getting intrinsic to the nerve, or just direct mass effect on the nerve and cause that denervation change. Um, I believe that because you have this, I have this case from a colleague in Brazil that shows the tibiofibular ganglion, and then this is the intraneural component of the ganglion cyst here and here, and then downstream, tremendous amount of denervation change in the, in the calf musculature. Another kind of cute case, certainly not if you're the patient, but this patient had bad pain in the hip immediately after the hip arthroplasty. Even in the recovery room, they had bad pain. And so this is several months, even a year or two after that operation was done, and she's referred to Stanford for you know, further workup. Um, and if you look on the right side here, there's something that's pretty bright right in that region there. And if we look at the sagittal reformation here, you see that this fixation screw in the acetabulum goes way outside the bone, right into the region of the sciatic nerve on the right side there. So that was really the problem um, that wasn't acknowledged or recognized by the person that put that screw in. Ultimately, she ended up having the screw um, removed or cut off there. Um, unfortunately, the nerve had sustained fairly permanent damage at that point. A little bit of a subtle case here, but you see in this patient, axial T1, axial T2, can you see the difference in bulk of the adductor musculature here on the right compared to the left, and some mild intensity, hyperintensity on the right? So that's some denervation change in the adductor group, and that's supplied by the obturator nerve. This patient had had a hysterectomy done, and I didn't really show you the, the obturator nerve on those other sections. I'll try to show it to you in a minute. Um, but that nerve comes right through the obturator foramen here and supplies the adductor musculature, and it's, it's easily potentially injured in the case of a hysterectomy. Here's another neurogram. So this is a MIP of a lumbosacral neurogram, and all these nerves are increased in size and intensity in this 19-year-old woman that has diabetes, but actually fairly limited symptoms. <clears throat> These are the, what we call cube on the GE platform, and this is the, the in-phase combined image, which includes water and fat signal intensity, and this is the T2-weighted image with, uh, with fat suppression, or the, sort of the fat-only image. So if I stop this, <clears throat> I'm gonna scroll along here. So again, to find the nerves, it's actually helpful to use this T1-weighted, sorry, I'm misspeaking. It's helpful to use this image that has both fat and water components to it, and then looking for the signal intensity on this one that has just the uh, fat suppression. But can you see here now, like we looked at the femoral nerves a minute ago on that other patient, so here's femoral nerve here and here, so on the T2 here and here, markedly enlarged and hyperintense. And if we go for, further posteriorly, you can see the sciatic nerves also being bilaterally hyperintense and enlarged. And so we don't know exactly what this is, but it's clearly like a case of like bilateral and fairly diffuse neuropathy, if you will, involving this whole lumbosacral plexus. So 
involving multiple of those components. Here on the axial, so just to take a look at where to look for that femoral nerve, which is a fairly common uh, nerve abnormality here on the axial T1. So here's iliac iliacus here and the psoas, and the nerve should be sitting in this little crotch right between the two. So here's the femoral nerves here and here, okay? And scrolling down towards the groin, um, you can see the nerves are abnormal all the way down there. And then looking at the sciatic nerves, there's vessels in here, but this structure, there's sciatic nerve there and there, and that's just way too hyperintense. <clears throat> um, all right, so getting close to the end of the cases here. This was a case that my one of my colleagues was so proud of because they're like, Chris, we have this case of uh, you know tibial nerve abnormality and all this denervation change involving the hamstring muscles. And so we had a hamstring talk the other day, but it's like, the way I remember the hamstring anatomy is it goes like, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, MTB. So it's like membranosis, tendinosis, and biceps. So the biceps is lateral here. This is the long head biceps. This is actually the short head biceps. And this colleague was so proud because they're like, you know, and we know this is tibial nerve because this, is, this, this part of the biceps is innervated by the tibial nerve and the short head is innervated by the common fibular nerve. And I said, terrific, I love the case. I'm putting it in my nerve uh, talk. Um, but what they hadn't quite noticed is shown on this uh, set of images right here, where if you look at the coronals, <clears throat> you can see all that abnormality involving the right, sorry, the left-sided muscles here. But there's also this distortion, right? There's a lot of like architectural distortion. There's a lot of fatty atrophy there. Um, and indeed, what this actually represents is that it's a chronic muscle injury, chronic tear. So the hamstrings are basically torn off the ischial tuberosity here. It's a naked tuberosity there. Um, <clears throat> and then further down, you know, you still have all this atrophy because they're not being, being you know, functional. <clears throat> Sorry, but the, uh, but the short head is intact. And I think that's because this still has some, you know, connection with the short head biceps down towards the fibula, but the long head is just not being used. So again, kind of a pitfall you have to be careful about. <clears throat> All right, so some take home points on this talk. So assess these nerves on routine exam. So as you read other studies like hip, um, knee, ankle, try to take a look at the nerves to try to get a good baseline for what you think is normal. Um, for nerve imaging, the key thing is these high quality T1 and fat suppressed T2 images. Don't try to have to get too fancy. Some 3D sequences are very helpful, especially if you can get the combined fat water uh, <clears throat> images and the, and the, wa the water-only images. Take a look for the size, the intensity, the coarse, scarring, and, and masses. And then take a look downstream and see if there's abnormal signal within expected muscles. And, but there's other things that can cause it, whether it's a muscle disease or myotendinous injury. And then there are some atlases and books and articles um, it's fairly new territory, so I think we have quite a bit to learn still, but I hope I've convinced you that you can actually see nerve abnormalities. Um, there's a book by Chabra that came out a couple years ago that's pretty good. There's also a clinics article, um, set of articles, also by Avni Chabra and, and others that are fairly up to date, so that's not a bad resource if you want to learn more about this. 